All right, moving on. Next we have a discussion about digital tech feedback from the field, and that will be brought to us by Robert Pitts. Robert's from small town in Mississippi, Indianola, and started his career with ExxonMobil after completing his Master's of Information Systems degree with Mississippi State in 2008. He's been with ExxonMobil for about 16 years, hold, uh, holding multiple jobs over his career. He has held roles in IT, manufacturing US each, uh, in the U.S. East region, covering 20-plus facilities. In his role, he has developed deeper understanding of challenges workers faced in the field when trying to leverage mobile devices. It was this experience that led him to becoming an IT product, product manager for maintenance program where he was responsible for 20-plus applications, utilizing 42 st uh, sites globally. Uh, he led mobility study, putting the user's perspective as focus. Based on this study, he built a mobility program to support 20,000 mobile devices using 50-plus applications globally. He now serves as the global IT process, or excuse me, global projects IT discovery and strategy manager, working for or working with organizations to develop digital strategy that aligns with their business strategy. And joining him today, we also have Tasha David. She comes to us. Well, let me put it this way: with 12 years of direct experience conducting over. Uh, Conducting user experience studies, Tasha designs research strategies based on the time she has spent with her users and role, uh, and, and the role of product and process plays in their lives. She uncovers user behaviors, needs, and motivations to incorporate them into products she st is studying and uses the knowledge to make processes more efficient. Tasha is a native Houstonian, nice, uh, who grew up in the south side of Houston, myself. After she completed high school and diploma, she um, matriculated to Xavier University of Louisiana where she completed her BS in biology. Tasha has worked for many years as a laboratory technician. She decided she needed her career change. So today, uh, to uh, she decided to pursue a career in human factors and uh, user-centered uh, design and attended the University of Houston Clear Lake where she received her graduate degree, um, MA in, psycho in psychology. User experience research is where she found her passion for understanding the intersection of where humans and technology collide. She started her career at HP and then moved to ExxonMobil where she's been for the past seven years. So please welcome David, or excuse me, Robert and uh, Tasha to the stage. Good morning everyone, or good afternoon. Good morning. Thank you. So I'm assuming everyone has one of these, right? And maybe around 15, 20 years. I remember I got my first cell phone. I was in college. Now probably your children, 10, 11, 12, carry one of these. So in the manufacturing world, about 10 years ago, um, we started putting these devices in the hand of our field workers. We started putting these devices in the hand of our field workers. And over time, you, we added more things to them, whether it was um, applications or they can use, supposed to use them to do um, their job in a more productive and safe way. But the way we supported those devices didn't change, and we started seeing an issue. So we conducted a study to try to understand what was going on. My um, boss at the time and uh, one of our other executives started touring the different manufacturing sites, going around. They were talking about how great these mobile devices are. These applications is going to save us around $50 million annually. And they was praising them. But then the people at the site started saying, whoa, 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 calm down. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. I'm not using it. What's going on? And so there was a disconnect somewhere. On our end, we thought, man, we had just you know, changed the world. We had revolutionized everything. We have just put all this great technology in the hand of our field workers. But when they actually went to the site, they found out that wasn't the story. And because I had spent two years at our Joliet manufacturing site, I was one of the only few people within IT that had actually sat at a site before. He tapped me on the shoulder. He said, Robert, I need to understand what's going on. Could you look into this for me? I said, absolutely. So I called the plant manager here to ask them. They knew that they had an issue. They couldn't tell me what the issue was. I called someone else, um, they couldn't tell me what the issue was, so I said, forget it, I'm just going to remove all the middle people and go straight, straight to the people who actually are being asked to use these devices and talk to the field workers. And then what I found out was no one had actually done that. They knew the stuff wasn't working, they knew it wasn't being used, but no one somewhere along the way didn't actually go to the people who were using these devices. And to me, that's where all the knowledge was on whether or not how do you help people adopt and use something that you want them to use. So in this study, we did about 89 interviews. We had about 106 people in there. We visited four physical sites. We went to Baton Rouge, Beaumont, but we also went to Europe to go to Antwerp and Rotterdam. Just for those that are familiar, when you have certain um, technology devices being used within plants, you have different certifications that may apply in different countries. So we wanted to make sure we had a large enough sample size to fully represent our organization globally. Uh, we did two workshops after talking to them and we had one field user survey that got about 450 plus responses, I believe, uh, to make sure that we truly heard the voice of the people who was intended to use these devices. It was one of the best learning experiences that I had. And so I put together a team to help do this. I actually went and got two people that were in the field to be on my team. 
I know IT, I was great at IT, even though I have set in a manufacturing site for two years, I did not understand fully what they did in the field, and I wanted to develop an appreciation for that. And the only way I can do that was to get people who had actually been in the field and had done the job. And so by combining IT with the field person, we were able to better take a look at the whole system that was impacting them and try to come up with solutions that would better fit them. Um, Tasha, David, who was part of my team, was one of the people I brought in as a senior researcher. Where she added value to me was, you know, there are times that we sometimes come to these rooms, we sit, and we get ready to make decisions. And just human nature, you start making decisions that may be easier for you or your work there, or your process. And Tasha would quickly come in, she'd be like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. How does this benefit the field worker? How does this va add value to what they're doing? And so that quickly caused us to pause and take a step back and look at, again, the intended people that we want to use this, how do we keep their perspective in the forefront? And so when she did that, I then center my whole study around how do we keep the voice of the people, is what I called it, in every room that we go in, whether once I'm talking to them, I'm gonna have to go back to my manager, I'm gonna have to go to here and talk to all these different stakeholders, but the one thing I wanted to keep true was exactly the feedback that they were giving us. And I'll let Tasha talk a little bit more about that. How you guys doing? So when Robert said he was tapped on the shoulder, he came and then tapped me on the shoulder and he's like, Tasha, I need you to go talk to these people. Um, to give you a little bit of background about what I do, um, I, I call myself a behaviorist. So I sit down with people, I understand your environment, I understand um, the cultural aspects of what you're doing, um, how you're working, um, your everyday lives. So I don't know anything about you know, manufacturing. I don't know anything about being in the field, but it's not necessary. I can bring an objective um, perspective. So when I go out to these sites or when I go out and talk to people, I'm actually sitting and watching them do the things that they do, and it builds empathy, and that way I'm going to represent their perspective when I, you know, feed that information back to Robert, and then he feeds it back up to, you know, the chain of command. So it's quite valuable. A lot of times we talk about, you know, being in people's shoes, but how do you do that? You have to do that by actually talking to them working with them, sitting with them, understanding what they're doing. And, you know, we call them sometimes subject matter experts, but because they have that knowledge, you know, it's, it's important for us to really get into their shoes, follow them around, understand what their day is like. You know, I learned that they spend, you know, they work in shifts, 12 hours. Sometimes they're working morning shifts, sometimes they're working night shifts. So some of the feedback that we received, <laughs> You know, some of the feedback that we received, you know, it's the, the question of why aren't they using the devices? Why are the devices being thrown into um, drawers? They're being used as what we call door stops. You know, I go in and find out that why. You know, we spent a lot of money, you know, buying a lot of these uh, mobile devices, and then they're not using them. So it's like, okay, we can make some assumptions about why. I can sit in a room and try to figure it out, or I can just go out and ask people. I see you have your, um, your, your mobile device in your, uh, your locker. Why is that? Show me. And they, t they take you through that process. It's like, you know, when I'm out in the field, you know, I can't, sometimes I don't have Wi-Fi connectivity. Okay, well, that's interesting. Why is that? Maybe the manufacturing site has a dead spot. Maybe the phone is dead. There are lots of different reasons why. So being able to get that in the field, firsthand, con you know, you're just never going to have, you know, there's, that's like the gold, right? You're, you're like mining. That's that gold that you're looking for. So um, Robert, I brought Robert into the interviews, and he sat with us, and, you know, you get to, you know, talk to people. You get to understand, you know, their perspectives. And so being able, him being there firsthand and then taking that insight up to our management was priceless. So I won't go through all the challenges and recommendations, but what came out of a lot of those interviews was there were five components that um, seemed to bubble up. And this pyramid kind of is put in order in terms of how do you want to look at it from a foundational standpoint. One, digitization is coming. Most people look to digitize their manufacturing plants, or we call it the digital plan of tomorrow. Um, technology is coming. I know for some people it can be scary, um, the unknown. But one thing I found that was useful, you have to bring people along the way. So if you have a vision for how you want to digitize your site, and that's to me the place where you should start, but not only come up with that vision, communicate that out, not just to the other leaders at the plants, communicate it throughout the whole um, organization, and particularly for those that you want to use these, those are the first ones you need to get. For us, our vision was all about um, getting data to the right people at the right time so that they can do their job, they can have more productivity, that they can be safer while doing their job, all right? And one of the things that we did during this study, too, again, I had a vendor that came in to help do this, and I was trying to be very strategic. Whoever is leading these things, know your weak spots and bring in people that can help cover those weak spots. 
But also, I noticed some of those people had never been to an industrial site before. So they started trying to give me solutions on things that we can do, and there was just so much that was missing. So we decided to like take a trip out to those sites, and we pulled people out the field. We went into the console area, had some interviews. But that was more for the benefit of my team. And when they were able to see the environment which those people were working in, I no longer got questions about, well, why don't they just call the help desk? If you're out in Baytown at 110 degrees in the middle of the day, I guarantee you, you're not about to sit on phone with the help desk for two hours. And it's right? hot. It's Texas. <laughs> it's very hot. So you're not going to be in the sun like, hey, so what? step one, step two? It's like, no, no, no. 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 Right. Um, our, I, I literally set my phone outside, press record, because it's so loud out there. So when I went back to the Houston campus to talk to some of my senior management executives, I played that sound in the room and asked them to call the help desk. And then they, because you want to bring that feel back to them so they can truly understand what the experience was like for them, so that now when I'm giving them anecdotal stories to understand why we need to do something differently, they can get it. You heard Tasha talk about connectivity. I can give you the best device in the world, I can give you all the application that you want on it, but if you can't connect it to a single thing and have to drive back to somewhere to a desktop to upload your information, I haven't helped you that much and I probably have just extended your workday. Again, people may say, well, why don't they just go to what we have at our places called solution centers? These are just like little help desk areas where people can help you. Yeah, but if you're at the plant desk 45 minutes down the road, some site, sites are Twix sites, if you have to get somebody with a Twix card to help you get onto the site, now it's gonna take you four hours out your day just to get help with a tech, technology issue. Are you likely to go do that when your breaks are probably 15 or 20 minutes and you're working 12 hour shift? Exactly. And so it's going to understanding all these nuances and putting it into a package so that those that are making decisions that impact the connected worker helps out. And by doing that and taking their voice up line without filtering the message, for a lot of us, if you've been in corporate long enough, you know sometimes when we take things up line, that message gets a little watered down and watered down and watered down a little bit more. That wasn't going to work here. I did my darnest to be intentional about making sure that message stayed the same all the way up it went. Um, as Tasha told you, she quickly kept reminding me how does that impact the field worker. So I made sure that I didn't do that. And it bought a lot of buy-in for them because they actually finally felt like they was hurt. Even before we resolved anything for them, the fact that they had their voice now being heard made a huge difference. And now they were ready to get on board and actually see how can we come up with a solution to better help them. So once you start to get your connectivity in place, you roll out your devices, you have the applications on there. One of the other things we noticed was the way rollout was done. Um, a lot of our people that rolled these things out sat back in the office, they weren't at a site. So hey, here you go, we installed it. Oh, by the way, read this package. Okay, goodbye. That's not how those guys work. They like face-to-face, -face. they like physically touching someone. I had a guy on my team, so when they did projects, I would send him to the site. Uh, one site had only planned to use one application, but because we sent somebody there physically there to roll them out and teach it to them, they ended up deciding to use all 20. They didn't have to pay people overtime because they didn't have to recycle, and now they are rolling and humming like a bird. They were so thankful that um, it went a lot smoother. So the way you roll things out, the way you do training, and I've heard a lot of people here today talk about skills. One thing I encourage some of our people to do as they were going to the interview process, bake in some questions to help you identify people who may be more tech savvy and more likely to play with technology. And what you can do with those people is make them your SME or their power user, and then they can show the other people within the field that may, not, that may be a little hesitant or scared of technology. And when you have a mix of that baked in, you have your legacy knowledge people there too, but now they also have someone younger that can help them. And that's just going to help them bond better and begin to work better. And some of that knowledge transfer between each other that um, works that way. And the ten part that people used to focus on the most was like the field mobility support, which is like your help desk or your organizations uh, back that should help you troubleshoot these things. But honestly, if you can kind of do those first couple of things the right way, that becomes the minor issue there because that's just something that you have to do. Your phone is probably going to drop a call. Sorry, AT&T and Verizon is never going to get it to 100% where you're never going to have that call drop. Those things happen, but if you focus on all these things, at the top you have was your mobile enabled worker that is now able to be productive, use the application that, uh, the way they were designed to be used, and they can also get the help they want to. If someone is having an issue and you don't resolve it to three months later, yeah, you're gonna get your devices used as a doorstop. But if you have all these things happen where people have been properly enough trained and they can even get to some help on the same site with them, they're more than likely to start using those devices. You can actually start to get data and make some predictive analysis, make some data trends. You can then start to use all that information to start making some other decisions. And now you have a data-driven workforce that you can do other things with and spend your time on. One thing I will add is that the thing that we, I did notice is that some of the legacy people that weren't that good with the um, technology you know, were, were very hesitant to use it, but they started to partner up. And that's not something that you get without having talked to them. So they know that these applications are going to help them be more productive. So they started to partner with people who are very comfortable 
with using, you know, tech or just using phone, smartphones or, you know, apps. And then they started to kind of get more and more and more comfortable with it. So as time goes on, you know, maybe they're not as great, but they're not scared or terrified of it anymore because they know that they can go ask their partner, like, hey, guys, can you help me do whatever? And they're like, sure, hit, 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 done. So, you know, understanding your workforce, hiring the skills that, you know, are going to, you know, being, being uh, adaptable to new technology, um, that's really important as well because technology is here and it's not going to go away. So what we did to fix our issue, it may be different for different people, um, I built a team, I call it the Cogwell team in the center. For a lot of big corporations, um, teams get very comfortable operating in silos, they do their own thing, they don't think they need to talk to anyone else, um, but that impacts other people. So here you have product owners, these are your people that either help develop applications or push them out. They didn't understand the impact of stuff at our manufacturing site. You know, I remember one guy saying, well, you know, I support like 4,000 phones at the Houston campus, so I don't really have time to worry about your 10 phones. And then I was on the call and I said, well, but those 10 phones actually impact the bottom line more than these other phones that are at our office, so I don't really care about those office phones right now. I need you to actually address these guys out here at the site because that actually has a bigger impact. And so one thing this team in the middle does because it's a mix of people who has a network at the manufacturing site as well as back to those central organizations, they can now better articulate the impact that it's having and then it helps those centralized teams reprioritize what they consider to be important and not be important. Now, if you can do this, I think the perfect answer would have been if I actually could have had my product owner's device network all on one team with one supervisor, but that's not realistic for some location. So since that wasn't the case, I, the next best thing for me was to put that glue team in the middle. And then what you start to do is get a lot of knowledge of what people tend to understand about manufacturing site that they can continue to feed back to those centralized sites that had people that had never been to manufacturing sites before. And so what I tried to do was have what I call the anchor on there. That's at least one or two people, maybe even three if you can. Um, depend upon the size of your organization, that's all the way within that space that can truly help articulate how non-industrial sites work versus just how our office sites tend to work. So that was, a, again, it was a long study. I tried to summarize it into 30 minutes. So that's my talk for today, and I will open the floor up for questions. Thank you. Hi. I'm going to try to talk loud. Um, so Based on some of the comments you made, I'm going to make an assumption, and you can yes or no um, whether my assumption is correct. Um, I, the resistance to the change, did that primarily come from your more senior, more experienced uh, field workers? For some of the sites we went to, it did, but some of it also was because in the past when they had sought out help, it took months or so long and they just stopped trying, or they are report an issue, they don't ever hear back on it to six months later, they didn't care about it. Um, but some of our senior workers were some of the ones who didn't even want the devices to begin with. Um, and sometimes there's this fear that, oh, this is going to replace me, not that this is going to be more productive and help keep me safe. But part of that can be addressed through change management. Again, if you had a relationship with them, then you can actually quell those fears by saying, no, here's how it's going to help you do your job. It's not going to replace you doing your job. As a matter of fact, you have a lot of knowledge that I actually like to pick your brain and ask me, how can I improve this application if you will partner with me on it? So the, the, um, the folks that were more adaptable, as you mentioned, um, what I've seen in our industry is the, the more senior folks tend to have the most influence. Did you experience any of that where the, the, those that were resistant influenced those that weren't resistant? I would say it was a little bit of a combination. I, I mean, I can't say no, that didn't happen. There were some that did that, but for the most part, um, most of the senior management, they understood that you know technology is here, so they had to be able to use it, so they were, they wanted to cooperate and they wanted to be able to learn more because obviously it's job security, right? So, so they were, they wanted to, but there's a, you know, we're human, right? So there's this fear of what if I can't do it? Uh, what if I, what if I can't do it? And then I look stupid next to someone that's like half my age. But once you kind of, you know, start understanding and understand what that is, and you start to pair people together, then that, that eventually, it's not a magic pill, right? It eventually goes away, and then they become more comfortable, and then they become able to ask questions, even the hard, embarrassing ones, it's like, you know, I've been using this thing for, you know, three days, and I still don't understand how to open it, you know, and it's like, okay, well, you just do this, this, and this. So, you know, it's, it's a relationship that needs to be built, um, but it can, it can happen, you know, it's not easy, that's the thing. I will say from my side, I tried to be intentional about finding out who some of those influential people were, 
they don't know me. I'm coming from a um, central location. But I did have some contacts from Joliet from when I was at their site for a few years. And I had them put me in contact with some of the influential people so that they would be willing to open up. And one other thing that's not on here, we actually have a monthly meeting, what's called the Digital Manufacturing Action Team. And this is maybe a few IT people, but majority of people on the call that actually use it, that get together and talk about challenges, issues, and things like that. And sometimes they just help each other. Hey, we figured out this issue over here in Baton Rouge. Okay, there's no need to try to figure it out again in Baytown or Beaumont. Let's just do what you did over here. And so those influential people are on those calls, and oftentimes when we disseminate information, we did it through them. If I send an email to all our manufacturing site globally, it probably gets deleted. But if they send it, then all of a sudden they'll read it. Even if they just forward what I sent them, for whatever reason, people didn't read it when they see a name they know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Do all your sites have in-plant Wi-Fi? Not all of them, so they're at various different levels. Is that an issue with the ones that didn't? Yes. 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 So one of the challenges I saw with Wi-Fi at sites, it can be quite expensive, right, to get connectivity throughout your site. Um, but sometimes people will end up spending more than that because I do, they do what I call nickel and diamond. Okay, I only need fiber ran over here. I'm just going to go spend the 300K to run it here. Oh, okay, I need some to go over here. I'm just going to spend the 500K to run it here. Whereas they could have probably spent $3 million in one year and just fibered the whole site. But then you'll see over five years where they've probably spent twice as much as that. But those are individual budgets. So you had people working in silos within sites. Whereas when I saw several use cases like that going on, I would try to take it offline and say, hey, you have five different people trying to do this. It would be cheaper if you just did this as a collective site to run your fiber there. But they're at a different level. We had some with 60% coverage, some with 30% coverage, some with 15. It was just at various level. Um, the way we do things, typically our refinery plant managers uh, control the budget individually. Mm -hmm. So when you don't have a centralized bucket doing that, sometimes it becomes a challenge because they're weighing doing that versus their capital project that they have coming. How, how big a hurdle was that? for the sites that didn't have the Wi-Fi, for the operators and technicians that were yeah. using it in the field? Did, did there was a lot of negative feedback because there was of that? A, I wouldn't say it was negative. They, I don't know, people are adaptable. Okay. So they were like, oh, there's no Wi-Fi right here. And it's like, <laughs> okay, there's Wi-Fi right here. And then they start using it. So, you know, there's, um, you know, people adapt. A lot of times you see um, with those types of sites, they had to go back into the office, which might be a drive, you know. So they collect all the information that they need in the field, and then they just drive back and then input it into the system. So it's, it's, it's something that we don't particularly like, but they do adapt to the, the situation. And it, it varies across the different sites too. Yeah. Um, there are some that scream louder than others. Some are more forward thinking, even within one plant. Um, I know we have some of my colleagues here from Baton Rouge. I remember Baton Rouge Chemicals, no problem. We're gonna go ahead and do the whole fiber backbone and do this. Um, Baton Rouge Refinery, oh, I'm not sure. And so, I get that. I'm just waiting on Baton Rouge Chemicals to finish there. So when you hear less headaches going on over there, I'm hoping that influences they see. If you had to deal with what they did, you wouldn't still have all these headaches that you're having here. And sometimes you kind of have to do that. Thank you. So when we have, I was trying to visualize the meeting with my Thank you. Was related to um, balancing cybersecurity and production of the devices with the user interface. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that worked for you guys? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so recently within Europe, we had, that was a vulnerability release for one of our devices. Um, it, you can't predict when some of these vulnerabilities are going to be announced or come out right. And um, because it was on an older device, there wasn't going to be a patch release for it. And I think we had a thousand of these things in the field, meaning that to replace all of them would have been about one or two million dollars. Nobody had planned or budgeted for it, so there wasn't one or two million dollars around to replace it. So then you start to have the conversation, what risk are you willing to accept and continue to do this versus not accept and continue to move forward? So it just became a conversation back and forth. Um, I think what we ended up selling on was after digging deep into it, we didn't think the risk was enough to warrant replacing them right then, but we did immediately try to put the funds into the budget for the next year to replace those things. But that's always going to be an ongoing conversation between what level of risk are you willing to accept versus not. Because also you have to ask yourself, is there like two points um, to get onto your network? One, like do they have to physically be on the site to actually be part of your network? And even if they are on the site, are the application things you're using on your devices, do they have um, access back to your central um, intranet organization? Or are they all just on like an external Wi-Fi that doesn't have? So all those things play into, come into play. It really just depends on your level of comfort and risk that you're willing to take. But it's an ongoing conversation. Yeah, I'll also add too that, you know, we are risk adverse, as you know, ExxonMobil is. So we have a lot of training, lots and lots of training about cybersecurity. So um, once you curb people's behavior, 
and help them to understand why it's important, then they're more likely not to do it. So, you know, how often do we have to do cybersecurity? Once a year, twice a year? Cybersecurity training Tra twice a year. Yeah, but. so, you know, we are, we're training people, helping, to un helping them to understand the value and why you wouldn't want to click on, you know, a suspicious link <laughs> or, you know, maybe it's from your cousin and it's really not. So, you know, having people to understand, I think that, that definitely helps too. And one more, Joe. I know you got one right there. And then we'll move on. Um, on the maintenance side, uh, a lot of the value in these apps is access to uh, technical information. Um, in older plants, a lot of that information is on paper. Did you all run into that problem of having to digitize old uh, paper documents to be able to, to get that access for folks in the field? Uh, yes. And so, again, it goes back to one of our struggles was sometimes you may have an app that's actually great for digitizing forms. These two or three sites over here may be using it. These four or five may not be, and sometimes they just didn't know about it. So to me, we had a communication gap too somewhere, like why don't they know about what's going on over here? Um, part of the other challenge was when people were building these applications, if again, you're not talking to the people that's using it, you don't build functionality into it. Like maybe you can build a buck upload into it where I can scan 500 documents and then it automatically, but if you don't talk to people that do that, you develop an app where now you have to do data entry and some would just flat out tell you, I'm not dedicating the person to type up 9,000 pages, so now we're not even gonna use your app unless you go back and add this functionality. So it's again, that's where that team in the center comes into place when you hear those things, jump in the loop and communicate how those things can impact someone. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all, appreciate you. it. Thank you, David, uh, Robert, Carson. Thank you.